The book of Job, chapter 37. Book of Job, chapter 37. And I'll just read the verse and get started. Uh, he causeth it to come, whether for correction or for his land or for mercy. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us together again this evening. Lord, thank you for the message that we've heard already and uh, all those wonderful truths. Lord, we pray that that would uh, continue and you'd minister to our hearts. Help us to, more importantly, be hearers and uh, doers of the word, not hearers only. And we uh, pray that you will be glorified. We pray that you are, your spirit would be in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In Job chapter 37, you have this verse, and I, one time I was reading through Job 37, and uh, it caught my attention in the verses before it, speaking of the, uh, the weather, and this uh, especially the cloud in verse 11, because the question comes, what is it in verse 13? He causeth it to come, whether for correction or for his land or for mercy. And that's an easy verse to just read over and miss it, but I think much is said in this uh, one verse. He causeth it to come. What is it? He says it in verse 12, and it is turned round about by his counsels. You have to go back to at least verse 11 to find that it's a cloud he's speaking of, a thick cloud and a bright cloud. And if you look at the verses before that, even the, the breath of God and the frost is given. Uh, waters mentioned. Number nine, out of the south cometh the whirlwind. The whirlwind. And if you look back at verse uh, six, the snow, the small rain, the great rain of his strength. And I think God's talking about a storm when he says he causeth it to come from the context, the only thing I can reason that is, is that the, the it of verse 13 must be the storm that he was speaking of. And what's interesting about it is in Job chapter 1, Job experienced a storm that came into his life, cost him his children. And uh, Job chapter 1, if you'll turn there, I just have a three-point message based on 37, verse 13, why the storm comes, for correction, for his land, for mercy. And uh, we'll, we'll look at those, we'll try to 
try to uh, uh, pull as much out of there as we can. Amen. And uh, it's important, I think, to understand that in the book of Job, Job's problems begin in chapter 1. And as you know, it's a test in his life. God allows this to happen. But in verse 18, it said, While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So there was a whirlwind that came and blew the house down and uh, Job, uh, Job's problems were all associated with these things that happened in uh, chapter 1. And the rest of the book is about his three friends, as you know, they try to counsel him. I can't cover the entire story of Job, but it was the, the sons of God and Satan behind it all. They approach God and they... They uh, ask him, uh, is, there a, is there a perfect man? And, and God says, hast thou considered my servant Job? And then all those things start to happen in Job's life. And it begins with this storm. And by 37, by chapter 37, they're talking about a storm. And this is Elihu speaking now. Speaking of this storm that comes and, he, and Elihu is the only one of Job's friends, including Job, that wasn't rebuked by God and told they were wrong. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, my life verse is out of Job, Job 5.8. I would seek unto God, and unto God would I commit my cause. You say, how did you get that? I opened the Bible one time, put my finger down, and looked at what verse was under it. But it was one of those... Uh, <laughs> It was one of those guys, that, one of those friends of Job, those miserable comforters that come along when you have a problem. Uh, they came into Job's life and they tried to tell him, maybe it was this, maybe it was that. It's because, of, it's because you're doing this, you're thinking this, you're, your life has this problem, that problem. And uh, sometimes when you have a real problem or go through a real storm in life, people come along and they just try to diagnose things. And they try to point out why, why this happened. And you have to be careful about diagnosing what the problem is when we don't really know. <laughs> and if the more you want to know why God, the more likely you are, you are to get the wrong answer. Um, and the book of Job, the theme of the book of Job is why the righteous suffer. And there's much in the book of Job as to why the righteous suffer. Um, his friends were pointing out all sorts of things as to why, why, why this could happen. And you uh, come into problems in your life, and you can start asking the question, why? But Elihu was the only one that wasn't rebuked, and he's the one speaking now. He begins speaking there in uh, chapter 35 and verse 2. We can see that it is Elihu doing the talking here. In 35, 1, and then verse 2. Thinkest thou this to be right, that thou saidst my righteousness is more than God's? Now, uh, God rebuked the other guys, but not Elihu. Elihu was the only one that is really uh, given sound advice, at least. And he says, Thinkest thou this to be right, that thou saidst, apparently Job said this, that my righteousness is more than God's. I mean... And Elihu is the only one trustworthy, really, in his, in his advice. According to Elihu, Job was being self-righteous. He was self-righteously proud. And you know, uh, that, there is a, uh, there's a real problem with that. But I'm getting ahead of myself already. Why the storm comes? Why the storm comes? Um, storms, what, what could we say about storms? They're... They can, uh, they can produce fear, a great amount of fear. They produce uh, destruction. They can cause you to have to patiently wait. They can result in much loss. And uh, we very often can misdiagnose why they come into our lives or why they happen in the weather. Um, these uh, questions of why can be answered all in one verse there in verse 13. It, it says why it comes. He causeth it to come, whether for correction or for his land 
or for mercy. Those are, the, those are the storms that God brings into your life. Sometimes you can bring your own storm into life, and, you know, people say God controls the weather. I believe he can control the weather when he wants to control the weather, but not every storm, uh, it's just random disorder sometimes. And it's, uh, it's, it's caused by two opposing forces, a cold front and a warm front, and, and they, they, they clash, and then somehow it, it causes the wind, and it can cause a whirlwind even if, if the conditions are right. But it starts with that friction of two opposing forces, like me and my God. <laughs> It can, it can bring a storm into your life. And with Job, he, he had a problem that was called self-righteous, according to Elihu. So we know that. Not just my opinions here, but uh, it, according to Elihu, he was self-righteous. If you look at chapter 23, I think we can kind of see, because the first point of this is for correction. <laughs> that is one reason a storm can come into your life. And that's probably the most obvious reason. Um, and that's usually the reason everybody jumps to all those friends of his, they were trying to, they were trying to, they were trying to tell what, what is it Job did wrong that, uh, and then they were, they were not right about what he was wrong about. Elihu was, and he said he was self-righteous, but look what Job says in Job 23. And he says, then Job answered and said, even today is my complaint bitter. My stroke is heavier than my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. And this is Job talking about God. I would order my cause before him. I would fill my mouth with arguments. I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say unto me. Will he plead against me with his great power? No, but he would put strength in me. There the righteous might dispute with him. So should I be delivered forever from my judge. And you read into what uh, Job was thinking at that moment, and he thought, "I would." He, he thought, "I can escape God's judgment. I, I would, I would present my righteousness to Him, and He wouldn't have an answer. He wouldn't have anything to say." I suppose that was Job's attitude, based on what he said and what Elihu said that he said, uh, being self-righteous. And if we were to point out anything as to why the storm might have come into Job's life, I suppose that would be it, the self-righteousness. Because in chapter 38 and 39, it says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, So uh, an actual whirlwind is what blew the house down. An actual whirlwind is what we're talking about in chapter 37. And now there's a whirlwind or you could call it a tornado um, is there in chapter 38 and the Lord answers Job out of the whirlwind. Still to this day, people in America, maybe here as well, will say life is a whirlwind. It's not only I've got too many irons in the fire, but sometimes people say it's, oh, it's been a whirlwind. Where do they get that from? They get it from a King James Bible. Um, and even, even long into the days of that being an old time word of word for uh, tornado, uh, still people say it's been a whirlwind. Everything's a whirlwind. Um, but there's this idea of God speaking out of the whirlwind, and he, then he starts asking Job questions. <laughs> and Job, that was so confident in chapter 23, and he said, I would, I would demand of him, and he would answer me, and I would fill my mouth with arguments, and I would... I would, Job sits there silent with a foot in his mouth. There's another idiom. <laughs> um, but he's, uh, he's, he's silent, and God's asking him questions about where were you from creation? Where were you from the beginning of time? Okay, big boy, where were you when I did this, when I did that? And God's asking him these questions for two chapters. The next several pages of your Bible is God, uh, we say, grilling <laughs> Job with questions throws him right on the barbecue and he's uh grilling job with questions and i don't know uh if you've ever been through a storm that came from the lord some of us have been in a storm and job was definitely in a storm but sometimes it's for correction and number one job had a self-righteousness problem uh, a storm can be a judgment from God. That's not the only reason a storm will come in your life, but that's one reason. 
And it's probably the most obvious reason. But it can be a judgment of God. I remember in, uh, uh, in Florida, when we lived in Florida, there was Hurricane Katrina. And then there was a uh, hurricane that uh, hit New Orleans. And uh, these hurricanes that would come, preachers would say, it's the judgment of God. And then the media would say, oh, it's so horrible. How could you imply that God would have anything to do with this? Um, people get all upset about somebody pointing out the judgment of God. But all you can really say is maybe. Only God himself can say that this is for uh, correction. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it is. Uh, people don't even like to think about that. But you know, it, with the, uh, there was the perfect storm. And I don't have the, the, the details about all that, but it, it was right down to the, the same hour, I believe, that they were signing the land for peace, giving up Israel's land to Palestine. Way back in the administration of George Bush in the 90s, the perfect storm began to brew out on the sea, and it, it hit his own house. As, while he was signing the document, the storm began to brew. The whirlwind started to whirl. Uh, and there's, a, there's an entire book written about that. Uh, but you look back through history, and every single time they started giving up land, the land of Israel, for, for Palestine, which is always, it always backfires. <laughs> of course, they're not going to give you peace. They just want the land. They want the, we'll take the land, and no, there's not going to be peace, but we'll keep the land. And it always works out like that. And God's judgment, in the form of a storm usually, can be traced to the, the very same time frame. It's an amazing thing. But in Deuteronomy 28, there's a whole chapter about how God will curse Israel if they don't keep those commandments, and it includes weather events. In Deuteronomy 28, part of the curses, there's rain mentioned, and there's the, uh, the blasting mentioned. Um, sometimes it is God's judgment. Hebrews 12, 6, it says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. And if that's the situation, you can, you can always repent. Like Job repented at the end of the book of Job. He got it right. And I'm glad you can get it right when you got a storm that comes in your life and you know it's God's judgment. You can always go to him. You can, you can, you can repent. These hyper-dispensationalists, they say that you shouldn't ever repent that's not for Christians. They say um, that there's no uh, confession of sin for the Christian, but those are all, I, I'm thankful that I have a God that I can go to and I can just repent. I can turn back to him. I can tell him I'm a sinner and I can tell him I'm sorry. And I'm glad I can go to him. I mean, these guys, you wonder, they've got so much theology in their mind uh, trying to work out how in the world uh, we reconcile these words of repent and this and that, but then, I mean, you wouldn't even teach that you shouldn't tell your grandmother sorry. I don't know why they would teach you shouldn't tell God you're sorry. That's all repentance is. Job told God he's sorry. He got it right. And if you're a Christian and think you don't need to repent, I mean, that's, a, that's, that's probably the first thing you need to do to sort out some of the storms that have come in life. Uh, there, there can be a storm in life because God is judging and chastening, correcting. And if you didn't catch it, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. The correction comes because he loves us. That's a very, the very reason. He doesn't want us to go astray, so the judgment comes. We can be thankful for that. And we can tell him we're sorry. So that's reason number one. Um, why the storm comes. It's when the hot meets the cold. Uh, Galatians 6, 7 is another, another good reference. Uh, be not fooled, uh, be not deceived. God is not mocked whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. That shall, we're not to be deceived about that. Uh, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Uh, there, is, there is the law of reaping and sowing in life. And sometimes God will correct us. But number two is uh, less obvious. Less obvious. Sometimes, I, like I said from the beginning, we often misdiagnose the question why. Uh, judgment, or it might seem like judgment, comes into our life. But a storm comes into our life. 
and immediately we think it's judgment, but maybe it's not judgment. Maybe it's for his land. That was reason number two in Job 37, verse 13. He causeth it to come, the whirlwind, like the one that cost Job everything he cared about. He causeth it to come, whether for correction or for his land or for mercy. So number two, for his land. Um, you have to think about that. God brings a storm for his land, very often for his land. Uh, sometimes it's not even for me. Uh, in other words, it might be for someone else or something else. Um, God will bring the rain. He'll bring the storm. Uh, the, the, uh, the sower and the seed, the, the sower sows the seed. But that's an unnatural form. God's design for a tree that bears fruit and it has nuts or it has seeds and the wind blows. Nothing blows the seeds further than storm wind or a whirlwind. And God has a design in nature where the, the seed is scattered that way and the land benefits from the uh, storm. Uh, and when you consider erosion and of soil and God purging things, washing things out, it's for the land. And we could go further, and we could say it's for life, it's for growth. In the Christian life, this pictures um, the life of someone else. You must be born again, and we're out there giving out the gospel. Uh, sometimes God's storms in our life will be for the furtherance of the gospel without us even realizing it. It might be for somebody to observe what's happening in our life, how we deal with it, and they make their decision whether they believe that there's a God or not. That's something to be aware of. Uh, sometimes God brings a storm in our life for something else, for the life of some, something else, for the growth of something else, uh, for his land. For, uh, that, that's a physical storm for his land, but in the spiritual um, interpretation of that, we could look at that as uh, for others. And I want to give some examples of that. He does it to uh, purge out dead things. Drainage is another thing. Um, 2 Corinthians 1 verse 4. Who comforteth us in all our tribulation, uh, that we may comfort those who are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Uh, that's a thing to remember. But the blind man in John chapter 9 is a good example of what i'm trying to get across here in john chapter 9 it says and as jesus passed by he saw a man which was blind from his birth and his disciples asked him saying master who did sin this man or his parents that he was born blind jesus answered neither hath this man sinned nor his parents but that the works of god should be made manifest in him see everybody wanted to point at judgment they said his parents did something wrong. He did something wrong. Who did something wrong? We want to know. Somebody did something wrong. They did the same thing Job's friends did. So-called friends. <laughs> uh, they, they maybe weren't the best of friends, but those three guys that show up with Job, they're just trying to point out who did something wrong. They're like the policemen that show up, the, the fake police, <laughs> uh, pretending to be police. And they want to they want to call down the law on uh, whatever happened. Something wrong happened here. We know it. We just know it. Here's these guys in uh, John chapter nine, and they say, "Who did sin? This man or his parents that he was born blind?" Jesus answered, "It wasn't about that. Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him, or should be seen by others." Um, sometimes it's about others. You know, when uh, God brings correction or judgment into your life through a storm, when he uses it to correct you, it makes you stronger. When God uh, brings, brings the storm for his land or for someone else, it makes them stronger. And it, as far as I understand, that's how it works here. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. We're getting into another... Um, parable there but uh, back to Job ver uh, chapter 37 and verse 13 
for his land. If you look at, uh, well, let's go here. Um, you don't have to turn there, but Romans 5, verse 3 and 4, we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, experience hope. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, give a, I'll give an illustration. God brings the storm for his land, uh, for the life and growth of maybe something other than yourself. And God will bring that storm into your life one time we were uh, traveling in America on the highway, motorway, I'm not sure what, how you refer to that, but the, the main road that heads west in the United States, um, some, some of our ancestors uh, traveled on the Oregon Trail. If you've heard of the Oregon Trail, they would go to America, they'd get off the boat in New York City or they'd travel the Erie Canal and get off the boat near Detroit or somewhere and they'd start heading west through the Great Plains and they would come to the uh, Mountain Pass. Stevens Pass uh, is still there and the highway takes you right over it. But there's gr the Great Plains in the west of the United States until you come to those mountains in the north to get to Oregon. Everybody wanted to go to Oregon. They call it the Oregon Trail, those pioneers on the, on the wagons pulling them that way. And I was, uh, we were traveling that way and we saw the, the North Cascades, those, that mountain range, and we came coming up through it and everything's like a desert out there. It's just very dry and arid, uh, very dry, very, you know, not, not anything I would call beautiful. And when it comes to scenery, um, but you start driving up there and you get through those North Cascades. And as soon as you get over Stevens Pass, as soon as you get past the highest point coming through those mountains, all of a sudden everything looks so beautiful. Um, it's just uh, the greenery, the flowers, everything. Everything comes to life. You're going from desert behind you, going up through the mountains. You come to the other side and it's just the Garden of Eden. Um, is that was my perception of it, but I started thinking about that. That these same the same mountain range is what protects that dry area, that desert behind me, that protects it from the storms that are whipped up on the Pacific, and they're uh, the the that side of the mountain is battered with storms, and they got rainy weather. And when we were in Oregon, I think it rained every day. It's just rain, rain, rain. <laughs> uh, those that side of the mountains got battered completely with storms all the time, but it creates something beautiful. The storm comes for his land, and we can't forget that. Uh, he causeth the, it to rain on the just and the unjust. We're all in this together. It rains on me, it rains on them, and he causes the sun to shine on the just and the unjust. There's no difference. You know what? I, I might complain about the rain. If it's raining on me, there might be a rain cloud right over my head that follows me around, and I could complain about it, but it's not for me. It's for the land. <laughs> it was not for me to begin with. And we so often, like Job or like his friends, are looking at our problems or our storms that come into our life, and we think, why, God, why? <laughs> why would this happen to me? It's always happening to me. It's, it's just me, me I'm, 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 I just have a dark cloud following me around. And sometimes we can get that kind of an attitude. And it almost seems like when we have the attitude of God's just judging me, God's doing this, God's doing that in my life, then things just kind of go that way, don't they? You ever notice that? People ha have a dark cloud that follows them around. They complain about everything and then amazingly crazy things happen in their life that are very negative. It's like, I'm unlucky. I never get lucky. And then all of a sudden, these, <laughs> these things happen. My son uh, plays golf, and I, I caddy for him sometimes on the tour he's on. And, he, and uh, I see it in other players. I, I mean, I've caddied for him or walked along with him his whole life, and he's 21 years old now, um, still plays golf. But you... You see these guys, and I did it myself when I was younger, they miss a putt, and then they start getting upset. You can tell they're just, they think, they think God did that, or like God cares about golf, right? Or, or any kind of game or sport, and it's just, 
Time and chance happeneth to them all, the Bible says. And when you're dealing with a game of time and chance, you're going to get some good breaks and bad breaks. And you start bringing God into it and saying, I'm unlucky and God hates me and God doesn't care about me. He never answers my prayers about this time and chance game. Um, you can start getting into some real problems and you can, you can get a negative attitude. I had one myself when I was younger about that same game. <laughs> But you, you start to observe how things go. They get angry about this putt, and then they hit a ball into the woods on the next tee shot, and then they get angry about that, and then they start reading into it that, that, that God is judging their whole life or something. I'm, I'm just trying to guess what they're thinking. But it gets more and more negative, and, and then all of a sudden you start seeing... They, they hit a shot through trying to get out of the woods and it hits the tree and comes back right at them and goes behind them. And now it's, and I'm, I'm thinking, well, well, maybe God is doing this in their life now. <laughs> but it started with a bad attitude in the beginning. <laughs> the attitude got worse and worse and they start trying to blame God for everything. Maybe, maybe, maybe they, they don't even believe in God. But it seems like they think they're being judged or unlucky or the powers that be or raining down terrors upon me. And you can see how things go from bad to worse. It's an amazing thing, but sometimes we, our lives can be that way. Um, it's a misdiagnosis of the real problem. There's more than one reason why the rain comes or why the storm comes. It can be for his land. A perfumist will uh, take uh, rose petals in the old days, uh, nowadays it's all chemicals, I suppose, but in the old days they would take rose petals and they'd uh, take the mortar and pestle and grind those uh, rose pestles. They would crush those petals. And, uh, you know, if, you, if we thought that a rose had some, some kind of a soul, that we would call that very violent. But that's where the perfumist gets the, the best... Uh, scent out of the rose and produces a beautiful smelling, uh, wonderful smelling perfume out of crushed rose petals. And when we were uh, on deputation, after going west over those mountains and we were in Oregon, we uh, came back the other direction and uh, we were in a, a terrible accident. This was 2010. We were trying to raise support to serve God, to go to Scotland. We had to raise our finances to um, deal with immigration and, and uh, have an income and prove an income in order to be accepted into the country. And, and this was all because of uh, me seeking God's will and me believing that God called me to Scotland. A wild concept to begin with. And we're traveling the country, going from church to church. I think we went to over 200 churches, uh, presenting the need in Scotland. And, and, and some of them support, some of them don't. Some of them want to give toward it. But you have to do that. There's no other way that to, to prove an income to the government just to get into the country. So that took us all over the country. We, we had a travel trailer, we call it. And uh, that's what, how we were traveling in a... A 5.7 liter diesel uh, Ford, if you can believe that. <laughs> or maybe it was a 6.3, I can't remember. It was one of the two, but we had, a, we had a truck that we were pulling this camper with. And as you know, if you're pulling something behind you, it can, you know, it, it goes one way and it pulls the truck the other way. And, and I had pretty good control of it and everything, but we were traveling back east in uh, one morning and it was raining. It was raining, and uh, I come up behind a, a, a lorry, a semi-truck. In America, they call it a semi-truck. In Britain, they call it a lorry. So I don't know what you call it, but um, we came up to a slow-moving vehicle, and uh, <clears throat> I put my indicator on, and it's a rainy day. The roads are slick. It's out on the Great Plains where it was very windy. And the wind was moving the trailer, and it was it was not the greatest of conditions, but I didn't want to go as slow as the guy in front of me. He was going very slow. He had a much bigger rig than I had. And uh, I put my indicator on to indicate that I'm going to pass, and somebody comes flying up. And, and uh, right as I'm turning, 
they were in a blind spot and they come running up and and I, I uh, moved the wheel just ever so much to avoid hitting them because they, they, they saw my indicator that I've switched on and tried to get around me and this the semi truck apparently. And it was like, I didn't even know where they came from. They were going so fast. And, and so it, it caused me to correct the wheel and which things began to overcorrect until the trailer, I could see it out the right side and I, and I had the wheel turned all the way to the left and people have come to me since and said, you should have done this, you should have done that. Oh, okay, I know, well, <laughs> I was in the moment and I had the wheel turned all the way and the, the trailer was over there, I could see it. And all of a sudden you're going, I don't know, 50 miles an hour still and the thing's way over here, you're gonna start tumbling and that's what we did. We started tumbling. And uh, uh, it crushed in the top of the vehicle. It crushed the, the entire thing. It was in the brunt of the force was on my wife. Uh, she was in the passenger seat and it all, the, the vehicle crushed down on my wife. Um, the rest of us weren't injured. We had five, ch five boys in the vehicle at the same time. Uh, in that one, one of them, there no, four of them. There, two of them weren't born yet. It was 2010. But nobody was really injured. I had a few cuts on my head. My son had got, got some stitches and had a, a fracture in his foot. But my wife broke her neck. Uh, both of her arteries were dissected or torn. Um, she had a, in the hospital, she had a hemorrhage on the, on the brain. And the surgeon told me that he didn't know if she was going to live. We need to do an emergency surgery. They rushed in. They... Um, they uh, they did an emergency surgery and and I we th we thought she wasn't going to live, but her neck was broken, her arteries were torn, she was a month in the hospital. All these things it was it was such a a difficult ordeal. And at that moment, I was like, my reaction was I I give up, I'm not I'm not going forth anymore. I'm I, I told the Lord I'm I'm done. I'm I'm finished. This is, this is not going to happen now. And uh, <clears throat> my wife had to deal with that. And I, I just thought, you know, I tried, I'm, I'm going out, I'm trying to serve God. And then what? <laughs> the storm comes and it's, uh, it almost cost her life. And she came very near to dying. She was still in recovery. She wore a halo on a broken neck and had uh, eventually had to get plates in her in the back of her neck. There's still like plates and screws and stuff holding her neck, uh, the vertebrae together. Um, she's got scars from the where they went in for the surgery and uh, um, just very near death type of a thing. And in the moment, I thought this is going to be something she, she'll never recover from. This. It seemed like there's never going to be a recovery. And uh, you know, I, I had the thought that it was, it was a preaching illustration I'd heard before about the rose petals. And, and I just looked at it like God took my rose petal and just crushed my rose petal. And uh, I didn't know what to think about that. And I asked my wife, I said, what does this mean? Um, I, I don't even know if I asked her, but she, she ended up telling me, we have to do this. And she seemed uh, not so much, not so much into the idea of going to Scotland at first. But then, when that happened, she's the one that wanted to continue on. And I was, I was already about, to, I was ready to give up. I was like, I'm, I'm not, I'm not pursuing this anymore. I'm done. And if, uh, if we're ever going to get to Scotland, it's going to have to be a miracle. But she did that. And, you know, sometimes the, the storm comes in your life. I looked at that as a storm in my life. She could have looked at it as a storm in her life. But, it, but this, for, my, for me, that storm was, was uh, uh, you know, it was, it, for, for her, it, it, makes, it makes others stronger. It, the, storm, the storm really came in her life, and it made me stronger and our family stronger so that we could go and continue on. But you know, that's a, it's a difficult thing sometimes when a storm comes in your life 
to benefit somebody else. And ultimately, this was to get the gospel to Scotland and to start a church in Scotland. It was for other people, people we'd never met yet. And God was doing a work in, in our lives through a storm, through what we could have looked at as judgment. And we could have said, why, God? Why, why is this happening? Why me? Uh, we could have easily taken that attitude. And yet, um, it was for others. And I was the one that was the other, that she went through what she went through uh, just to uh, encourage me because I was ready to quit. I hope that illustrates what, uh, what I mean by the storm can come not just for correction, not just for um, our own sake, but for the sake of others. It can also come for mercy. Why does God send the storm? I don't claim to know all the ins and outs of the book of Job, but I know it was uh, the, the whole book deals with why do the righteous suffer, uh, seemingly undeserving. But God's always right in this same chapter in verse 23 it says touching the almighty we cannot find him out his excellent he is excellent in power and in judgment and in plenty of justice he will not afflict god doesn't do that he doesn't do something that's unjust there's always a reason for it men do therefore fear him he respecteth not any that are wise of heart the last point i want to make is uh it's for mercy Chapter 36, verse 24 is another good thing to realize. Remember that thou magnify his work which men behold. So right around the context of this, you see things as uh, that hint at the idea of maybe God doesn't do things only for you. He does it for somebody else. Maybe it's about somebody else. And so there's, a, there's reasons why the storm comes. For correction, for his land. Thirdly, for mercy. Maybe it, makes other, uh, maybe it makes you stronger through correction. Maybe it makes others stronger through uh, the idea of his land. It's for life and growth. And thirdly, if it's for mercy, maybe it makes our love stronger, our, our love with the Lord, our relationship with Jesus Christ can get stronger through a storm <laughs> of all things. And uh, what attitude we take in the storm or what reaction we have to the storm can have a lot to do with the Christian life. It really can, because it, it happens for mercy, for correction, for his land, and for mercy. God wants to be merciful. He wants to be merciful to those people that heard the preaching yesterday. Uh, God wants to be merciful in, in your life so that someone can observe that and get an, uh, an accurate estimation of what God is like and whether or not they should trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. Uh, it's to show his goodness like the, uh, like the rainbow in the sky that they've turned into a, a wrong symbol these days, but the rainbow was originally to, to because of God's promise that he wasn't going to again flood the earth. It's his mercy. And it's, uh, it's interesting when you look at a rainbow, it's those beautiful colors. Um, that's what comes after the storm. It comes after a storm. And sometimes we don't wait long enough to see the rainbow. And we just are uh, too busy uh, thinking about the storm and we never look for the rainbow. But you know, it's, it's for his mercy. Romans 8, 35 to 39 It's another uh, passage that comes to mind. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God 
which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, we often quote those last two verses, and we often remind ourselves of those, but we don't re remind ourselves of the, the verses before that as quite so much, but it's about the, the love of Christ in verse 35. Tribulation, distress, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. When the storm comes, it's about God's love. <clears throat> and it's about him having mercy on us. He, uh, he can bring a storm in our life so that he can have mercy. If there's no storm, if there's no, uh, if there's no nothing he can have mercy on, he can't show his mercy. And so sometimes as Christians, part of the Christian life is allowing God to show that he is merciful. In other words, we deserve a lot worse than a storm. Who can say amen to that? I deserve worse than a storm. I deserve worse than rain and wind and clouds and, and uh, the things that happen in life. I know what I deserve. I deserve to be burning in hell right now. Uh, but thanks to the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, I don't have to go there. Uh, he brings the storm for his mercy, to show his goodness, to create praise and thanks and love. You know, one time there was a tornado that actually went right over our heads. And I, I got to tell this story, one more story, of, a personal story of uh, a time uh, with my brother and sister-in-law. They were struggling with things and they were, uh, we were getting together one time and uh, um, just talking about the things of the Lord and we were actually praying uh, because we heard the siren about a, a, a tornado and they call that part of Ohio Tornado Alley. And we were at their house. The siren goes off. We turn on the, the television, and there is a tornado coming. It's heading directly for us. So we begin to pray and uh, just call on the name of the Lord, asking for mercy. And, you know, we, we looked it up the next day, and this tornado was coming right at us and it went right down a street about a mile from where I lived and it tore out the, the houses on both sides of the road. They just, it just tore them up and there was, some of them were just down to the foundation. All the wood was gone, everything had blown away. Uh, people were injured. I don't think anybody died that time, but people were injured, houses were, were destroyed. Um, it, uh, it came to the White Rock Quarry was the name of the quarry. It was just a couple miles from where I grew up. And uh, the quarry is a huge quarry. I used to think it looked like the Grand Canyon when I looked in it, but it was it's just a big, just a quarry. It's a big quarry, very large quarry. This tornado came to the quarry. It, I mean, the path, it was coming from the east and it, it mowed down those houses, came to the quarry and it lifted off. And then it touched down on a town on the other side of us, the house we were in was in a direct line. After it hit the quarry, skipped up in the air and touched down again, that's a whirlwind. It went right over our heads. And we were in that house praying. We didn't even know it. It went right over our heads. We looked, we knew from the next day where it touched down, the houses that were destroyed. Uh, but sure enough, it, was, it went right over our heads. And you know what that is? That's God's mercy. And when God shows you his mercy, you'll never forget it. <laughs> and you'll be able to tell the story, and you'll be able to brag on him and praise him. And, uh, and most of all, you'll be able to love him even more. Uh, it's easier to love him when we know how merciful he is by personal experience. <laughs> and it, it, just, it just makes your, your love, your bond with the Lord even stronger. Because the storms that come in like maybe you're not in a storm. Maybe you've been through one in the past and you still can't understand. Maybe you've misdiagnosed it in the past and you still think it was God judging you or maybe that was it. Maybe, uh, maybe, it, maybe it was for another reason. Uh, sometimes I wonder if it can be for all three reasons. But you know, we don't always know why the storm comes. But one thing we can take away from it is that God is merciful. God is to be praised and we don't understand the whole outcome but, you know, there's, a, there's three reasons there why that storm will come in your life. And I don't know if maybe you're going to head into a storm. We don't know when the next storm will hit. And uh, it's, it's helpful to remember why the Bible says the storm comes. Uh, the Bible says it comes for those three reasons. 
and that concludes what I had to say about it. But you know, it's uh, it's important to remember that Job ended up being restored with everything that he had before. Everything he had was restored to him, and what he was left with was a memory. He didn't have. Uh, he, he, he gained more, the Bible said, in the end than what he had before of children, lands, the things that he lost, the cattle, the sheep, and, um, and Job was restored more, but what he had was a memory. And what was that memory? It was him knowing that God was merciful after he had uh, made it right. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for those storms you bring in our lives sometimes and how you can work in it, how it can affect us and even affect others. Sometimes we don't even realize what you're doing in the life of someone else when we go through a storm. And uh, God, it's uh, even if it's for judgment, we can say thank you. And Lord, we just ask that you will help us to be mindful of this thing where it's so often misjudged as being for some other reason than it really is. And God, we don't always understand it, but we can trust you through it. And we can patiently wait until we get an answer and uh, see what it's worth. And Lord, we ask that you will be glorified in those storms in our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Let's have a break for about five minutes. And we'll go hang.